There's a movie called Alien. Yes. And I saw it. Yes. And after seeing it, I was haunted for 10 years. Oh, with, how exciting. <laughs> I would have literally night terrors of this thing coming at me that was coming out of the stomach of the Well, character. actually, no, you don't. What happened is <clears throat> you're having encounters with other beings. Those memories have been suppressed. And when you saw the movie, it triggered, on an unconscious level, the encounters that you had that were fearful for you. So it's not actually the movie that's doing it. The movie triggered something that's actually happened in your life that you're not completely remembering. Do you understand? Okay. Are you sure you understand? Well, I understand. I don't Do know you understand the concept it. on your planet that has been labeled alien abduction? Yes. Well, you're a part of that. Was I abducted? Yes. Oh my God. Many times. Oh my God. And the idea, therefore, is that even though those memories of that abduction were suppressed, the movie triggered it to a degree that haunts you because it's telling you there's something else there. There's something you don't quite remember that's real. It's not the movie that's real. It's your experience that it's reminding you of. It doesn't mean that the experience was actually something to be afraid of. All it is saying is that it's reminding you that you were afraid in the experience because you felt out of control and they were what you would consider to be alien beings. Yes? You follow me so far? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. It just causes more questions. Oh, well, I understand and I'm about to answer a couple of them. Okay. The beings that you typically call the greys that are involved with that particular encounter scenario are not actually aliens in the strictest sense of that term. As we have already mentioned, they are actually a mutated race of humans from a parallel earth that destroyed their reality, lost the ability to reproduce, and knew that the only way to reconstruct their culture was to, in a sense, shift to a parallel reality that still contained humans with viable DNA, blend that genetic material with their own to create a hybrid race, one of which we are, which perpetuated their society. You, on a higher level, agreed to participate in that, even though your physical mind doesn't really remember. But on a spirit level, you agreed to participate in that, and one of the beings that you actually encountered in that particular experience was actually a parallel version of you in that society. Is this making any more sense? I have never been speechless in my entire life. <laughs> I don't even know it. Yeah. All right. It is making sense. Here's a suggestion for you. Don't run from the fear. Run toward it. Because it's just a dark glass that you can break through. And when you break through on the other side you will wake up into an understanding of what's going on and start remembering more about your intentional part in the entire agenda of what's going on, which is connected to the evolution of your planet. Because eventually your world will become what we term the sixth hybrid race. These encounters is part of that experience. Yes? Yes. So you have agreed to participate in this, and if you ask for more clarity when you go to sleep, ask for more clarity, more awareness, more remembrance, it will be given to you eventually. Because you'll be coming from a position of strength, a position of equality. You will know that you're not really out of control. You will understand your part in the entire program. And you will gain more confidence in your ability to communicate more clearly with those beings and more consciously be aware of what's going on and have more apparent control in that situation. Make sense? Yes. Uh, I have something that, now I have another question yes. regarding that. Um, those gray people, Yes. Um, are they sort of acting as angels in my life? Well, not exactly. They do watch over you from time to time, but not exactly in the way you mean it when you use the term angel. There is an angelic level to consciousness, an angelic realm, and spirits that in that sense guide you and watch you. The gray beings from time to time sort of participate in that way, but not in the same way that you think of when you think of angels. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Have they saved my life three times? That's why I'm asking. I've had three miraculous things happen. Well, they have been involved in it, but that also involved higher levels of being. In other words, we sense that at least on one of those occasions, you actually did die. But you were given a choice to continue the life without knowing you had died. That's possible, you know. Because all you're doing is shifting into a parallel reality where a version of you still exists. And you just continue on as if nothing happened, or perhaps at the very most, you think, oh, well, how did I get out of that scrape? I don't know. You didn't, actually. But it is made to seem as if you did. Okay, can I just say this? Uh, yes, I you can just say whatever you want. Last year, February, I fell downstairs, landed face first on concrete. You broke your neck. You and, died. And I had not a scratch on my face when I woke up. Because it wasn't you that fell down the stairs. You're in a different body, in a different reality. So similar, you don't know that it's not the same one. But it might as well be, because it still fulfills the theme that you're exploring. It's close enough. Makes sense? All right, I'm glad y'all came back for part two of the alien adoptions. You already know that there's a lot of different stories that people have been putting out and it comes out as falsely, but I'm going to just use my discernment with the videos I have chosen and I want to know y'all opinion and what y'all think on what was said. Okay, do y'all remember when I made that video about me having a dream about me getting a duck off the front porch of my house? I don't, you know what? It's fine. Met, must have been a parallel reality because, you know, the memories of me being in that parallel reality must have came over here for some reason. Because I don't even know what happened to the version of me that was in that parallel. She gone. She, she, she somewhere else. But anyways, I believe in parallel realities. And I do believe that there are hybrid humans. And they have been interacting with the greys. We already know about the greys. We already know about the paid people who've been paid off to talk about these alien encounters. So, yeah. Now, I'm about to show you guys a video of a woman who is remembering her encounter with a mantis being. Check this out. I opened my eyes and saw a room with metal walls that had lights, buttons and switches all over. I was laying on my back and the mantis was adjusting some kind of controls on the wall across from me. The creature looked at me and I got the impression that it had been waiting for me to wake up. It walked over and touched my forehead and suddenly I was seeing through the creature's eyes. I could see everything in the most bizarre way. It was like seeing all sides of everything inside and out at the same time. While this was happening, I also felt an intense and terrible fear. I understood that while I was seeing through the mantis's eyes, it was also seeing through my eyes, and it was terrified of my limited vision. It seemed as if the creature became horribly claustrophobic and pulled away from me, and that's all I remember. I have heard about these different alien races. And like I said, and like the universe has said, as above, so below. So I do believe that there are mantis beings and insectoids. And let, let me just show you what I, what I was talking about last year. For some reason, I grew a strange interest in animals. I am not taking any chances. Do y'all remember when I said this? The creature that don't even look like it's supposed to be from this earth. Or could it have just been a creature from space? Now you can say what you want, but I bet you we are not the only beings, only species, only creatures that are in this universe. So I did some digging on some of these animals, and they look like some of these gods or alien races. Let's just start with these lions. There is an alien race called the Lyrans who have incarnated here physically and spiritually to help us evolve our consciousness. You know that saying they drew it because they synced it? On the walls of Egypt. And y'all know how they say that dolphins are way smarter than humans? Well, that's not a coincidence either. There is a tribe called the Dogon. They have strong beliefs that these amphibious fish-like creatures, ancestral fish-like spirits who came from the sky and taught them so much spiritual information that they use to this day. Because we just can't deny the existence of mermaids. Dolphins are highly intelligent beings, must have got it from them. There is also another alien race called the Avians. They look like birds and they're like eight feet tall. They exist in a very, very high dimension. They're trying to help us find unity instead of being separate from each other. They have been known to speak through these birds as spirits. And again, they drew it because they saw it. They have already been here. Do not get me started on these snakes. There are depictions of them everywhere as high vibrational beings. They drew it because they saw it. 
And if y'all don't know about these reptilians already, who have shape-shifting abilities, who have taken root in our political, social, religious, and financial part of our system. Sometimes known to be working with the Illuminati. Oh yeah, the elephants too. Giving wisdom and knowledge. Some of these animals are not just animals and could be descendants of these alien races. We know that everything is all connected. So with me saying that about the animals and the insectoids and the they how they look like certain gods and aliens that they have been put out. What do you think about our design? I've, I've already showed you that they have talked about hybrid humans. What is the highest version or the evolved version, the extraterrestrial version of us? The story of Travis Walton still remains a very strong story to this day of being inducted in 1974 by beings from another planet. When Travis is taken up into the craft, he still to this day has very detailed imagery of what he saw and who he spoke to. He describes humanoid figures that look like humans but weren't human. The story would gain so much attention, in 1993, a film would be made on the story. The film pushes the story a little more into a fictional realm, but there are some parts of it that Travis says were true to his side of the events. The interesting part with Travis's story is that in the past 40 years, it has not changed. It stayed the same. Travis has multiple witnesses that were with him the night he was abducted himself in Snowflake, Arizona. In 1975. When you think about and actually look at these beings that have been trying to do experiments on, you know, humans, they look like they have descended. Like, you know, not to talk about how they look, you know, no offense, aliens out there. I'm not trying to talk about y'all, you know, preference and personal looks, but the way they look in this movie, which was based off of a true event from this man named Travis, they look like they have descended from human. He said they look humanoid, but they look like they descended. And they're trying to do experiments to try to ascend through us, through the ones who are actually here. What happened in the TV show, The 100? Stay with me. In this TV show, right, the world had been ended by an AI robot who wanted to save the planet. Humanity was basically, you know, killing the planet, right? So during this time, the rich people knew that this was about to happen due to the upgrade of technology and the stuff that was going on in p politics. So they had created a bunker called Mount Weather. And these rich people survived in this bunker for about 300, 400 years. On the outside, when the world was being destroyed, they went underground, they descended. And some people also went to space in a spaceship. There were also some people who survived the bombings and the world ending and their blood, their DNA had upgraded. Same as the people who went to space. Face. Their bodies were more powerful and stronger biologically. Now the rich people who decided to stay, they did not upgrade at all. Their blood was still weak. Their bodies were still weak and it couldn't survive the outside of Earth. So they all they could do was stay inside of that chamber as the Earth started to upgrade itself. Now the people who went to space and the people who survived Earth, you know, made the sacrifices to ascend. They actually started to be experimented on by the people who descended and went underground and they started to capture them and take their blood and use them. They basically didn't go through the ascension process and wanted to feed off of the people who did in order to, for them to keep thriving and surviving. Now, doesn't that sound like the beings who have made contracts with ET races that have decided to use us, experiment on us? If these are highly advanced beings and they have highly advanced technology, what do they need to experiment on us for? They, they've they ascended, right? They are in the, the highest form of, they can travel the space and they can do all these amazing things. They are experimenting on us because of the power that we have in our bodies it makes you realize the power that we have down here that we have down here and just like the people who were in the cage in the episodes of this tv show they didn't realize the power that they had because then they couldn't even go outside the ones that they encaged they were more powerful than them. They could survive. Just a little penny for your thought about the human race that, you know, seems to be unintelligent and not that spiritual, not that technological, not that smart. It's a reason why they are experimenting on us. We're powerful. But let's get back into the rest of the clips that I have that I want to show y'all in my TikTok likes. <laughs> I want to play this. I know that it's an AI video, but just listen to it. Bob Lazar emerged in the late 1980s claiming to have worked at a secret site near Area 51 where UFOs were stored and studied. He said the UFOs were powered by an unknown element he called Element 115, which allows warping of space-time. 
This element has since been synthesized but doesn't exhibit such exotic properties. Among documents Lazar saw was one titled EBE, which he assumed stood for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. It contained biological information on alien life forms. The document apparently described how these beings helped proto-humans evolve, with sections titled Genetics and Mutations and Amp Religion. Lazar claims the document heavily implied that modern religions are based partially on humans' ancient interaction with aliens who shaped our development. However, there is no independent verification of Lazar's claims. His credibility has been debated due to contradictions in his statements over time. If such documents did exist, their corroboration of religious accounts could dramatically reshape human origins' narratives. But without more evidence, Lazar's specific assertions linking aliens to religion remain highly controversial and unproven. So, do you remember when I talked about that story with that girl who saw the gray alien go through the wall? That's basically an example of warping of space-time. We actually were able to do that physically and we have the ability to do that. It's just, you know, about the lock codes in our DNA and stuff. We are a very, very powerful race down here. So, that's why it's so important for them to keep us at certain mental states so we can't evolve, ascend. We start with Travis Walton himself, here in our Washington studio. Thousands of Americans claim they've had a terrifying UFO experience. Many such stories fall apart under scientific scrutiny. But this one impresses a lot of people. This is Sitgreaves National Forest. Located in northern Arizona, its trees cover over 2 million acres of land. But on November 5th, 1975, it became the location of one of the most well-documented alien abduction cases ever. Picture a night much like this, quiet, serene, seemingly ordinary. But on this particular night, reality itself would be shattered, giving rise to a mystery that still haunts the minds of those who dare to explore it. This is the case of Travis Walton, an alien encounter that'll leave you questioning the very fabric of our existence. Existence. It all started when a seven-man crew of lumberjacks were hired to go and cut down a large section of trees deep inside the forest. Now, on the day of the incident, the guys were running a little behind pace for their deadline to get the job done. Here is Mike Rogers, his friend and a witness to the incident. I was the crew boss, and I hired Travis and several other guys. Travis was my best friend. As soon as the sun came up, all seven men packed into one truck and drove out to the remote site they'd been working at, where they planned to stay all the way until sunset. Now, aside from the overtime, this day was fairly usual, except for the fact that Mike Rogers, the crew boss, and Travis Walton were butting heads all day. Usually they were best friends, but a few days before, they had gotten into a heated argument which caused tensions to be high, even at work. He had gone out to see this girlfriend of mine, so we got in a fight over that. But despite their differences, they were able to work all day until it was literally too dark to see anything, and that's when all the guys crammed back into the truck and started driving back out of the forest. Now, because they were so deep inside, they didn't expect to see anybody except for the occasional hunter. That's why they were very confused when they saw that right off the road as they were driving out was a bright light that was coming through the trees. We hadn't driven very far when we caught glimmers of this glow coming through the trees. Confused, nobody had any idea what this could be. You don't normally see any light at all out in the woods at night. It wasn't headlights because they were too bright. One guy thought it might be the moon, but that wasn't true because the moon was clearly visible in another part of the sky. And now somebody's saying, well, maybe it's a plane crash, but I'm looking at it, you know, and it's, it's not a plane crash. And it almost looked like it could have been a forest fire, but that didn't make sense either because it almost looked like the light was coming from above the ground. It's kind of like light shining through a lampshade, but it's kind of yellowish glow to it. I mean, that's what it appeared to me. That's why Mike Rogers decided to turn the truck and start going towards the lights just to check out what was going on. And as they got within a few hundred feet, they noticed the trees start to open up into a clearing. And when we broke into the clearing, there it was. In the middle of the clearing was a very bright saucer-shaped object that was glowing, not making any noise, and hovering just above the ground. It was so smooth, it was metallic, it was both giving off light and reflecting light at the same time. At this moment, nearly every guy froze, not knowing exactly how to process what they were looking at. Except for Travis, who without hesitation jumped out of the truck and started running towards this thing at a full sprint. Uh, you know, I just wanted to see it 
up close, not real close. So yeah. I was actually assuming that it would take off. Now, maybe it was the emotional state he was in given their recent fight with his best friend, or maybe it was the raging hormones pulsing through his 22 year old body. But either way, Travis kind of had this reputation of being a little bit of a daredevil because literally the week before the crew had seen a bear in the woods and Travis sprinted at the thing to scare it off. And now Travis found himself running directly at this flying saucer showing no fear. It was a rather impulsive thing to do and I was regretting it almost as quickly as I did it. As he got closer to this thing, it wasn't moving and he started to hear this high pitched humming noise that was coming from the craft, almost like an electrical buzz. It was just such an intense sound where the lows were something you really felt more than heard and the highs were kind of like something that was like inside your head rather than coming through your ear. I mean, the guys in the truck were even feeling this vibration too. When my hands were on the steering wheel, I could feel it and my elbow was on the window. I could feel it through that because it started getting more intense louder and more volume and this started to spook travis so that's why he jumped down into a crouching position now almost directly under the craft and that's when his fight or flight response kicked in so he stood up to try to run away from this thing but as soon as he stood up a bright beam of light shot out of the craft and hit travis bam that's when it hit me so my head the other way and then the woods all lit up a bluish green and when i look back he's a few feet off the ground and he's stretched out like this all six men who were still in the truck watched in horror as they thought this thing had just killed their friend Travis. So without hesitation, Mike floored the gas pedal and peeled off in the other direction. And after they had gotten a few miles away, the guys were still freaking out until they saw that whatever this bright craft was, it zipped off into space at breakneck speed. So they started to gather their thoughts a little bit and one of the guys was like, yo guys, we have to go back and get Travis. We can't just leave him there. Finally, I just said, I'm going back. You can stay here or get in the truck. And it I was surprised that they all got in the truck. Because if there was a small chance that Travis was still alive, he wouldn't survive the night. It simply got too cold at that time of the year in Northern Arizona, meaning that if the craft didn't kill him, the hypothermia would have. So Mike turned the truck around and started driving back towards this clearing. And when they got there, they expected that they would find Travis's body laying somewhere on the ground. And much to their surprise, not only was the craft gone, but Travis Walton was too. They were obviously very upset about something. And I said, what do you mean they got Travis? According to their story, they turned around and went back Travis was not there. Put yourself in Ellison's shoes for a second. You're working in a small town of Snowflake, Arizona, that's so small, basically everybody knows everybody. And in the middle of the night, six young guys come up to you and tell you this crazy story about seeing a flying saucer in the woods and seeing it zap their best friend and then take him off into space. I mean, I'm a conspiracy theorist and even I would have a hard time believing that story. And I tried to get just as close to each one of them as I could to see if I could detect odors of marijuana or or alcohol or anything like that. So rather than taking their story at face value, Ellison started to think that maybe these guys killed their friend and dumped his body in the woods somewhere. So he almost started to treat this like a murder investigation. If somebody is out here that's reportedly missing, I need to find that person. The first step, they need to go out to the clearing and investigate the scene and hopefully find Travis's body. That's when he called the Navajo County Sheriff, the dog handlers from the Arizona State Prison, and gathered as many people as he could to form a search party to go out there and look for Travis's body somewhere. And after searching all night and the entire next day, they found nothing. We never found a footprint or a sign anywhere of Travis Walton. Assuming there must have been foul play of some sort, Ellison started to tell the guys, listen, if you just tell us what happened and tell us where Travis is, we can end this whole thing right now. Because regardless of how adamant these guys were about their story and what happened with his craft, he simply couldn't bring himself to believe them. He says that he didn't believe us or disbelieve us. You know, he was just being neutral. The police had to look at the much more obvious real world possibility that one way or another, Travis lost his life and the body was hit. And he was determined to get his version of the truth out of these guys one way or another. Sir, I'm not here to determine if this is a hoax. I'm here to determine if law has been broken. So he called a guy named Cy Gilson, who was the number one polygrapher in the state of Arizona, to come and put these guys under a lie detector test to figure out what might have actually happened to Travis. The entire test is established by research from a Dr. Raskin of the University of Utah, who done many, many years of research on its validity and its accuracy. The very next day, 
day, Gilson showed up to town and interrogated each one of the crew members one by one, starting with Steve Pierce, because at 17 years old, he was the youngest guy in the group, so they figured that because he was the youngest, he would be the easiest one to crack. Someone like that is more likely to admit that it's a sham, so he's the one I wanted to choose first, because if it was a sham, it would save a lot of time and effort on my part and everybody else. I was scared to death. I figured I was going to flunk it, because all week long, I've been hearing, well, they're going to set it up to make you guys look guilty. Each polygraph session took about two hours, where the guys were asked the same four questions over and over again. Did you murder Travis Walton? Was Travis harmed by some guy in the group? Did you see a flying saucer? Did this flying saucer hit Travis with a bright beam of light? And after questioning each one of the guys, much to his surprise, they all passed with flying colors. Frankly, when I finished with him, I was quite surprised myself because it was passing the exam. But despite this result, nobody was prepared for what happened. Travis Walton opened his eyes and found himself lying on his back in the middle of the road. The first thing he saw when he looked up were bright lights coming off the bottom of this flying saucer that was hovering 20 feet above him. Then suddenly, it shot off like a bullet into space. Right, and I could see a light on the bottom of a, of a flying saucer, and it just went straight up really fast without a sound. There wasn't a person in sight, but Travis looked around and he noticed that there were some phone booths right up the road. So he made his way over there and used the spare change that was still in his pocket to call his brother Dwayne. He answered and said, who is this? And I tried to tell him and he said, I think you got the wrong number and he started to hang up. And Dwayne, who would be getting prank calls all week because his brother was maybe murdered or maybe abducted by aliens, assumed this was another one of those calls, so he was like, yo, this is not a joke, don't call here again. I just screamed at him that, you know, it was me, and, and so he, he stopped and he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll get somebody to, to, to come and get you. So he jumped in his car and drove to Heber, Arizona, where Travis was, where he found Travis sitting on the ground inside the phone booth leaning against the wall. Travis was extremely terrified, extremely weak, and also had about five days of beard growth. I was thinking this was still the same night, and he said, Travis, feel your face. And I reached up and felt that I had a five-day growth of beard, and, uh, you know, that came as really a terrible shock. So using a fake name, he checked Travis into the ER. We had him checked by uh, a couple of MDs and they, they ran some tests. I don't have all the results, but I can say this, that there was uh, a urine analysis done on uh, the first urine sample after this incident, and this completely does away with the idea that there was any drug involvement that some people brought up. Uh, that and the blood samples really straighten that out. And upon getting him examined, the doctors who were familiar with the story had found that Travis lost about 12 pounds in the five days he was gone. And he also had this weird puncture mark on the inside of his arm that couldn't be explained. So they tried to ask Travis, Travis, like, what happened to you? Where have you been? And when Travis, who was in a catatonic state, could calm down and gather his thoughts for a little bit, he was able to tell them, I was in the forest with the guys. We saw a flying saucer and the next thing I knew I was laying in the street. When I did hear that Travis had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the real thing. I just looked at my mom and said, I told you we didn't kill him. And from the way that Travis was talking, they could tell that he thought it was still the same day. So they broke the news to Travis. Travis, you've been missing for five days. The next day, the story of Travis's return made international headlines. Because what started off as a murder investigation had now just become a hoax investigation. And by the next day, this tiny town of Snowflake, Arizona had become flooded with UFO enthusiasts and reporters from every news outlet. The first night, I laid down in bed in the phone run. It did not stop until daylight forever. I was called by Canada, I was called by England, I was called by Japan, I was called by Russia, I was called by several Asian countries, I was called, call, 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 all night long. But the truth is, Travis was in no shape to be doing any interviews, because he was still trying to process the probably very traumatic experience he just went through. It was just too traumatic. They didn't even have the term post-traumatic stress disorder in those days, you know? And any time that people would try to ask him, hey, what happened while you were gone? What happened while you were 
were on this alien ship, as soon as he would start trying to recall the memories, he would start stressing out and have a panic attack. The media scrutiny was so intense. Once it was even suspected that when my brother was involved, the reporters were knocking on the door there constantly. When we went to leave the hospital, and somebody yelled out, there he is, and they chased us in through traffic. Either way, to come to the bottom of what may have actually happened, if there was any foul play, if this was a hoax, the sheriff still needed to get Travis's statement of what happened. So he decided to once again take matters into his own hands by ordering Travis to undergo a lie detector test of his own. But at the time this test was scheduled, Travis never showed up. He was scheduled to take an examination with me at our office in Phoenix at the time. He never showed up for it, but I think it's more Dwayne's influence rather than his that he didn't show up. Something that looked awfully suspicious to anybody who was a skeptic of the story. I was in such a fragile condition that my brother made all these decisions. I didn't even talk to him or discuss these things with him, tell him what I wanted, whether I would do this interview or do that or anything. I was, you know, not in that kind of shape. He even talked to a few psychologists that informed him the test itself doesn't measure lies versus truth. It only measures stress levels inside the body. I advise him not to because what it actually measures is stress. And questions about stressful memories would bring stress reactions, so it would have been meaningless to uh, have him take that test at the time. It would have a lot of false impressions. So that's when a group called the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, or APRO, reached out to Travis's brother to offer resources and help. And one of the first things they did was they offered for Travis to undergo hypnotic regression therapy. That way he could be able to clearly recall these memories without experiencing any of the anxiety and stress of the moment. The whole process of hypnosis is a sort of a deep relaxation at the same time you're confronting this, these memories. Now obviously there's always going to be some debate on exactly how accurate hypnotic regressions are, with skeptics always claiming that false memories could be implanted. But you've got to remember, Travis already had a lot of these memories, and all the hypnosis would do would put him into a deep state of relaxation. That way he could actually verbalize these memories without having a panic attack. I recount the memories for the first time in their entirety without so much of the fear that was just keeping me from even speaking without breaking down. Looking up at a light, shining down on me from the ceiling. I could tell I was leaning up on a, on a bed or a table or something because the ceiling was close. He then looked around and noticed that three humanoid looking beings were standing directly over him. And I saw two men le leaning over me. They, were, they, were, they weren't really men. They were a lot like... Uh, uh, they were a lot like men, but they weren't quite human. And they were dressed in kind of a brownish orange. They had large, black, almond-shaped eyes, their skin was gray, and their faces were devoid of any emotion. That's when one of them noticed that Travis had woken up, and he started to alert the other two beings. Freaked out, Travis jumped off the table and grabbed the first object he could get his hands on. And I grabbed a, uh, a, a tube, a clear piece of glass or something and I, I tried to break off the end to get something sharp to, to defend myself with but what scared Travis the most is that despite how confrontational he'd become these beings were completely non-reactive to him they just looked at him and then they started walking towards the edge of the room where the wall opened up to a door slid open they walked out and then it slid shut behind them they didn't try to approach or, or anything they just left they just ran out real fast and uh, I was alone there for several minutes and I, I couldn't catch my breath. It was very hot. Now that he was alone, he was able to catch his breath for a second and start assessing the scene. He started looking around, but nothing seemed even remotely familiar to him. Everything was so foreign, so alien. And aside from the table and the door, he couldn't make sense of any of it. Um, uh, uh, I, I was leaning, I couldn't stand up very well, I was breathing very heavily, and I was afraid they'd come back. A few minutes later, the sliding door on the wall opened back up again, and now there were two human beings standing there with spacesuits and a helmet on. And when I say human, I mean they looked like normal human beings, people like you and I, except they had bright blonde hair and blue eyes, almost Nordic looking in appearance.
if you want to watch the full version you're gonna have to go to his page um i think it is there it is. The Chilling Alien Abduction of Travis Walton. Did it really happen? Because he did a really good job with his edits and his uh, explanation of the video. I want to make sure that he gets all of his coins for everything that he has put together about the Travis story. So y'all go over there and go to his page and watch the full version of the video. I love y'all. Thank you for watching this video. I hope y'all have a good rest of y'all day and stay dangerous. Please continue to evolve in your ascension and in your mind and enjoy life. <laughs> I'm going to get to editing this video. See y'all later on the next one.